Now, some items that every physics lab will have include meter rulers, often a bit more bashed up than this one because they're used as swords by teachers as well, uh, and also blocks of wood because they're cheap and kids can't break them. But actually, what we can do is some quite good analysis of this, and we can use a block of wood to maybe model something like a racing car. Okay, and what we can look at is maybe how the initial velocity of this block of wood affects the distance that it takes to stop. So this is modelling uh, a racing car perhaps, or you know, some kind of vehicle, and its braking distance. Uh, and how that braking distance, you know, from the, the point that the brakes are applied to the vehicle comes to a complete halt, is affected by the initial velocity of that vehicle. So this is a, a practical that you can do. And uh, it's a, quite a straightforward setup. You've got a meter ruler to measure the distance that something travels. And also, you know, if it's a meter ruler, then your minimum distance is zero uh, and your maximum distance is going to be one meter. And that takes a bit of trial and error of actually sliding this block along to see how much force it needs to get it moving. But how do you measure the velocity? Because we can't just do, you know, speed equals distance over time because we've got a deceleration due to the friction on the ground. And to do that, we use a light gate. So a light gate is pretty common lab equipment. And what it has is a small sensor in here, often like an infrared beam that's being picked up over here. And what it records is the time that that beam is broken for. Now there's different ways to set it up. There's different sorts of light gates, you know, PASCO, Data Harvest. And I'm not gonna go into the actual setup of how you actually set this up on an iPad or a laptop, because that really depends on what your school has. The thing is that whatever you've got, you'll be able to use it with a bit of help from your teachers. So what we're going to do is, in order to work out how long this, how fast this block is traveling, we use something called an interrupt card. Now this card here, it's just a piece of card. And what we can do is we can attach it to the side of the light gate, uh, sorry, the side of the block of wood. As this block of wood then passes underneath the light gate, what we're doing is we are timing how long it takes for this known length of card to pass through. So what I did, I cut this on the guillotine so we've got nice uh, straight parallel sides, and I measured this out to be 100 millimeters across. What that means then is that you can either use this data if you just record the time from the light gate, or actually what you can do with a light gate is you can just set this up uh, with one uh, value of, and of, of card that goes through it, and you set that up so you say it's 10 centimetres. And that means as this records the time, it then works out the velocity of this object moving through it. What that means then is that you can take some data. And you can basically look at the velocity of the block of wood or the average velocity of that block of wood as it moves through the light gate. And you set the light gate up at zero meters. Uh, and what you can then do is look at the stopping distance for that block of wood, so the distance it takes to stop. Obviously velocity measured in uh, meters per second and the distance measured in meters. And the range of distances you want to go from range from about zero down to 100, uh, sorry, 1.00 zero meters because we're measuring the nearest millimeter. Now this is something where um, it's very hard to take repeat readings but what you can do is actually plot the data as you record it and what you might find is uh, say you've got a graph here, Oops, not the best graph, you've got velocity here and you've got the distance traveled. What you'll find is that um, as you plot some data what you get are maybe clusters of data and then maybe big gaps. And that means you, you realise that actually maybe some of your, your initial slides are too weak and you've got to kind of put a bit more effort into it. And that then allows you to get enough data. So what should you expect to see? Well, you wouldn't expect this. The velocity is not proportional to the distance that the block travels. So why is it not directly proportional? Well, if we think about this car, uh, which is being modelled by this block, uh, the faster this car goes, the more kinetic energy it has. And indeed, uh, the kinetic energy is going to be equal to a half mv squared. Okay. Um, however, as the brakes are then, uh, you know, uh, the brake pads are touching the disc and the car starts to slow down, just like we've got the frictional force of this block on the table, what we find is that the brakes are having to do work. And indeed, the work done is equal to the force times the distance moved. Okay. Now, um, effectively, if you've got something where uh, that the, all the energy is transferred uh, into thermal energy by the brakes, or in this case, it's thermal energy uh, by the friction down here, we can say then that this initial kinetic energy, a half mv squared, is gonna be equal to the work done by the brakes, which equals force times distance. Now, this car doesn't change mass, neither does the block, and the force applied by the brakes, if that's constant, or indeed the frictional force between the block and the table, that will be a constant value. That means then that m and f are both constants, 
obviously half is a constant, so that means then that v squared should be proportional to the distance travelled. What that means is if you go uh, twice as fast, uh, it will take four times further to stop. And you should find something similar with your data. So uh, this is a nice, straightforward, practical, easy to set up, easy to do. And what we're really looking at is how a block travelling on the desk is modelling the behaviour of a real life object.